Father, we come before you today hum humbly, bowing our hearts. And Lord, we praise you through every season of our lives. In the mountaintop, in the valley deep, Lord, we lift a song of praise. Because you are a God who is from everlasting to everlasting. You hold all things in your hand. And God, today, as we come into your presence, we want to lay all our burdens, all our fears, and all our cares behind us. Lord, and we want to be enraptured into your holy presence. Thank you for giving us peace. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So Lord, we come. Holy Spirit, we invite you. Bring us into the embrace of the Father. So that we may worship Him in spirit and in truth. And we may magnify the name of Jesus and lift Him high on our praises today. We pray and we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hello, Valley Spark Baptist Church, aunties and uncles, brothers and sisters, and the kids. How are you doing this morning? I hope and pray that you are fine and well. And I want you to know that God loves you very much. And I want you to know that His eyes upon you and He's watching over you, especially during this time. So let's just look up to Him, call upon Him. Yeah, he is near to us. Now I want to read to us from Isaiah 40, verse 28 to 31, a familiar scripture. It says, Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of, end, of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So let's bless Him because of the promise in His Word that as we wait upon Him, our strength will be renewed, our courage will be renewed, our spirits will be renewed. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength arises, we wait upon Sing it one more time. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength arises, strength arises, we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer.
Father, we want to declare today that you are above all. You're above all things, oh God. And we come running after you, Lord, to hide ourselves under the shadow of your wings.
else can touch my heart like you do And I could search for all eternity long And find there is no like you There is no
Thank you. 
worship you in the spirit and in truth for all eternity. Father, we worship you. Thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. All these years, you have been faithful. You've not just shortchanged us, oh God. We worship you, Father. You are worthy of all our worship and praise. And we thank you, God. We thank you, God. For your blessings flow to us, even right now. I want you to lift your hands right now. Just lift both your hands and begin to say, Thank you, Lord, for the blessings from heaven. Your blessings of peace, of grace, and anointing. freedom we love you father with all of our hearts mind soul and strength thank you god thank you for everything lord in jesus name we pray and ask this
Tuesday after the meeting, I spoke to a family. Their concern is that they are not comfortable with the M food. So I set aside this matter. But after the call from Christine, I looked into this matter seriously and prayed to have a Chinese caterer. Then this caterer came into my mind, whom I used to order food for old folks' home 
and even our Christmas, uh, I mean Chinese church Christmas celebration. So I called and shared the Makan Gongsi project and asked him to consider. I told him, don't have to give me the answer now. But to my surprise, he said, I'm going to give you the answer Which means, he said, I don't need to consider anymore. Now I can give you the answer. Yes. Then he continued to say, this is doing good work. I praised him and said, you are really a good man. To cut the story short, he said, I can even deliver to these people if it's on my way to do my daily delivery. I'm really touched by this man. Though he's not a Christian yet, but he's willing to help the needy and walk the extra mile. Hope this will encourage us to continue to be city on a hill. Thank you. Greetings to all of you. Shalom. I hope all of you are well. Uh, before we look into the word of God today, I'd like to uh, lead us in the word of prayer. Let us pray. Father, we need you. Holy Spirit, we pray that you will come and be our teacher. Lord, as we study your word this morning, we pray, O oh God, that you will convict us you will illuminate your word and help us to understand as we look into your word today. I pray for all of us that you will give us listening ears, O oh Lord. And I pray for myself that you will use me to deliver your word clearly. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Today I want to speak to you about eternal security and the text that i will be preaching on is taken from revelation chapter 20 verse 11 and 15. but before i start i want to uh, record my thanks to uh, reverend george ong from singapore i called him uh, yesterday to talk to him that i'll be sharing from this text uh, just to ask for his uh, opinion and uh, I consider Reverend George Ong as somebody uh, who is um, familiar with uh, this subject matter of eschatology. Uh, this is really uh, not a very easy subject to preach on uh, because people have uh, differing views. And this morning I want to uh, begin by asking you a question. What is the most valuable or expensive thing that a person can possess in this world? Let me repeat the question. What is the most valuable or expensive thing that a person has or possess in this world? Jesus answered it this way. He said, what good Will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Matthew 16, 26. According to Jesus, the most valuable thing that we possess is our soul. And every one of us, we have a soul. Whether you are big, you are small, you are rich, you are poor, everybody is given a soul by God. And sometimes the Bible refers this word soul as heart. 
but it basically means the same thing. It refers to our inner being or our inner self, what we cannot see physically. And the Word of God also tells us that our soul is eternal, means it lives on forever and ever. The irony is this, everyone possesses a soul and some people they may not even aware of it. But the problem is people do not know the richness of the soul and they tend to want to trade their soul for something else. Just like Esau in the Bible, who sold his soul for a bowl of soup. That is the reason why the Bible says that above all else, above everything else, we have to guard our heart for it is the wellspring of life. Guard means we have to preciously take care of our heart because it is the most precious and most important thing in our lives, more precious than diamond or anything valuable in our life that we need to take care of it well. And that is also why God has said in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, He gave this responsibility to the leaders of the church to watch over the souls of people. To watch over the souls of people. More than anything else, God has called the leaders of the church to watch over the soul of the people more than physical needs, more than properties, more than their cats or their dogs. On Monday, Brother Singh Hock sent me this picture. And the message in this picture is very clear. People are more concerned about the virus than their eternal security. Now, I'm not saying that we are not supposed to be concerned about the virus. Please hear me. Our concerns are valid. They are legit. But what we need to be more concerned of is really the souls of people, especially our own soul and the souls of the people who are not yet saved. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 12, verses 4 to 5. He said, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. My brothers and sisters, today I want to talk to you about a very serious matter. I want to talk to you about the subject of judgment. Judgment is a reality. Judgment is taught by Jesus and many others in the Bible. One thing is for sure, my brothers and sisters, all of us, when we pass on from this earth, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Now, when I talk about judgment, I know that there are many people who have differing views on that. Because it is really not a very easy subject to really support one view or another. 
But I want to share with you that basically there are two views on judgment. Okay, there could be more, but basically there are two. There are people who believe, maybe this is majority of the people who believe that there are two judgments. One judgment is the judgment for believers. And this judgment for believers happens in a separate event. And then there will be another judgment, which is the final judgment that is happening at the great white throne. And that is the judgment for unbelievers. It means believers will not be present at that judgment. But there are also others who believe that there is only one judgment taking place at the great white throne. Both believers and unbelievers will stand before the great white throne and believers at that time will be judged according to their deeds. They will be rewarded accordingly and their names are already written in the book of life and they will proceed to be with God in the new heaven and new earth. But for those people whose names are not written in the book of life, they will be thrown into the lake of fire. My brothers and sisters, this is really a very solemn, sober topic. And I want to tell you that at the final day of judgment, no one can escape. All will stand before God. There is no u turn And it will be for some an exhilarating joy. But for some, it will be an abysmal sorrow. Today, this message is primarily addressed to people who are unsaved. The reason I preach this message to you is because I am concerned for you. And I can tell you that God is concerned about your soul more than anything else. God is concerned about your soul. I also mean those who attend church or even have said the sinner's prayer but they have no absolute relationship with God. Their lives are not changed. They still enjoy the world and live a sinful life like everybody else. There is no fruit of repentance. There is no evidence of salvation in these people's life and to me in my opinion they are not saved my brothers and sisters today there are many many different gospels that are being preached in the world but in the bible there is only one gospel that has been preached that is the gospel of the kingdom and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe with all my heart that if you really understand this gospel and you really have received Jesus and tasted his goodness, there is no way that your life will not be changed. Because that relationship, that love relationship that you have with God compels you to live evil and to live a godly life. And to those people who are unsafe, let me tell you that Judgment Day will be fearsome it will probably and it will be the most terrible day in your life.
Let us get into the word. Let me read to you from Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea, will, the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each one was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Verse 11 starts with the word, Then. Then I saw a great white throne. When you see the word then, it means that it is a continuation of something. We have to go back to what was going on before to understand what the author is trying to say about now and what is going to come. So I want to take you back in summary to Revelation 19 and 20. Revelation 19 talks about the coming of Jesus Christ or his second coming. And Revelation 19 also talks about the battle, the Armageddon, where God defeated the enemy. And it also talks about judgment, judgment of the beast, which is the Antichrist, as well as the false prophet. And when we go to Revelation 20, it's talking about the millennium means the 1,000 years Jesus will reign together with the martyrs. And in this 1,000 years, the angel will come from heaven with a chain and he will bind Satan and he will cast him and lock him up in Hades. But after this 1,000 years, Satan will be released to deceive the nations and the earth for a while before he will be judged and thrown into the lake of fire to be tormented forever and ever. I want you to see one thing in common between Revelation 19 and 20. The one word that is common is judgment. Revelation 19 talks about the judgment of the beast and the false prophet. Revelation 20 talks about the judgment of Satan. Now you may ask, why does God need to do this? There could be many answers, but I want you to understand this. I want to tell you that God does this is because He wants to get rid of evil. And when we come to Revelation 20 verses 11 to 15, it is the second part of God getting rid of evil. And this second part is about the getting rid of evil men, which Jesus called 
souls, the unsafe, the people who have called him Lord, Lord, and yet do not know him. And this is also confirmed by Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 10. He said this, Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And this includes those who call themselves Christians but never worked out their salvation with fear and trembling. Why does God want to get rid of evil? The answer is very simple. If you read on in Revelation 21, God is going to build a new heaven and a new earth. And there is no place for Satan, no place for Antichrist, no place for false prophets, and no place for evil people who have never confessed Jesus to be their Savior, who are never clothed in His righteousness. They all will be judged and thrown into the lake of fire. The reason is very simple. Because if God let all these people in to the new heaven and new earth, they will corrupt it again. Now God may be speaking to you as one of the people who are not saved. And God has asked me to now speak to you. And it is still not too late. It is near not too late to prepare yourself for the judgment of God. Now let's dive into verse 1. The Apostle John said, I saw a great white throne and him who was sitting on it and him who was sitting in, on it. Now it was not mentioned who was really sitting on the throne. Some people say it is God. Some people say it is Jesus. It is not very clear here. But I think that it was not mentioned purposely which person in the Trinity is seated on the throne is because this is really the fullness of God. It is that oneness of God. That that God that sits on that throne is that fullness of the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit sitting there to pronounce judgment. Now, there is one more thing that I want to say to you and I do not want you to lose sight on. is this the magnitude of the great white throne. It's magnitude. According to Isaiah 66, he said that this is really gigantic. Gigantic. If I were Isaiah, it will be very difficult for me to explain as well and to picture that it is really unfathomable because God is big 
and everything in heaven is big in comparison to what we have ever seen in this life. If you read Isaiah 40, you will see how he has described what he saw about God and heaven. Isaiah 40, for example, he said that the entire Lebanon is not sufficient for its altar fire. Its animals not sufficient for burnt offering. Just the entire nation of Lebanon is not sufficient for burnt offerings at the altar. Just imagine that. It's another one. Isaiah said, God measures the oceans in the hollow of his hand. God measures the oceans in the hollow of his hand. It's how big God is. I don't want you to lose sight of this because we will come back to this. And the throne is great. It's called the great white throne. It is great. It is magnificent. It is big. And it is white. It is dazzling white. And it shines bright like the sun. Just like you try to look at the sun with your naked eyes. You are, you are not able to look at it. And that is how it will be like during the last day of judgment that your eyes can't even see the throne because it is so bright. It is so pure. It is so holy that there is not even a spot of darkness or unholiness in God. God's holiness is so glaring and so intimidating that when we stand before Him, everything of us will become really small and we will be exposed. And I want you to look at the word throne. Isaiah said, Heaven is God's throne. The entire heaven is God's throne. And the earth, that big globe, is just a place where God rests his foot. That is how big God is. And this throne is not an ordinary throne. It is the throne of thrones. If you read Revelation from the beginning until now, you probably come across different parts of Revelation that talks about throne. For example, in Revelation 20, 20 uh, verse 4, it talks about the thrones on which Christ and the martyrs seated to rule and to judge. And this throne that is mentioned in verse 4 is nothing compared to this throne. It is not the same throne that we are talking about here. It is just unfathomable. It is just indescribable. And then when we see, uh, we go further in verse 1, it says, the heaven and earth fled from his presence. The heaven and earth fled. What does it mean? Fled. Run away. Hide. What does it mean? I want us to picture this. This is really, really not a very good example. But it gives us an idea. 
picture a big storm is coming, the biggest storm that you have ever seen. All the sky became dark, there's thunder, there's lightning. And every human being are so fearful. Animals run, birds just fly frantically, run, seek shelter. Because of fear, because they sense an impending danger on them. This is the same scenario, but at a much, much larger scale. At that time, the Bible says, the heaven and the earth fled. Apostle Peter said, heaven and earth pass away. Means that the first order of creation is being rolled up like a scroll and it is vanished in this presence of the Holy God at the judgment seat. It is very, very frightening. It is very, very intimidating. God's gigantic presence alone is enough to send chills into our spinal cord. And I saw the dead, the great and small, standing before the throne. I saw the dead. Who are the dead? The great and small. Great and small. Probably people who were kings, who were nobles, who were rulers, who were great people on earth, as well as those people who are small. Maybe they are not so big, not significant. They stand before the throne. They stand before the throne at this last and final judgment. Now, who are the dead? Who are the dead? Bible scholars, Bible teachers, some of them I really respect. They have different views on this. One of the views is the dead refers to only unbelievers. Unbelievers. There are no Christians at the great white throne. But of course, there is another view that uh, scholars also believe that at the great white throne, everybody will be standing there. But at the great white throne, there are two judgments which we will go into it. One judgment is the judgment of deeds. Means we will be judged according to what we do or don't do. And we will get reward or punishment. Whichever view that you want to take, it is okay. But most important thing that we need to know is that all of us, whether it will be sooner or later, judgment one or judgment two, we will all have to account for the deeds that we do while we are given this body on earth. God will judge us. Standing before this great white throne are all the dead. All people who have ever lived will stand before the great white throne. It will be like a sea of people. It will be like millions and millions of football stadiums coming together. I do not know how big that is. 
But even that, in comparison with God and the throne, it is very small. Because Isaiah said the nations are just a drop in the bucket. That is how small the sea of people are in comparison to God. I believe everyone will have a chance to stand before God in judgment. And at that time, let us tell God how big we are. We can tell God how big we are, how great we are, how accomplished we are. I want to see, especially those who curse and swear using God's name. Those who taunt and ridicule and profane God's name. I want to see how they respond in front of that holy God. I can now imagine that their jaws will drop to the floor. They will be speechless, silence, just pin drop silence. And probably kneel down and beg and beg and beg God, please, please, please. But let me tell you that it is too late. At that time, it is too late. Grace had been withdrawn. There is no more forgiveness. No mercy. There is no propitiation for such people at the judgment seat of God. It is over. It is over for such people who have never received Jesus. People who never forsake their evil ways and turn to God. It is over for them. There is no U-turn. Jesus talked of a parable parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And all of us know that parable. Even though it is a parable, it is a story, but it tells us about one message, that there is no turning back for the rich man. No turning back. And it is torturing in hell. It gives me no pleasure to preach this message to you. I am preaching this to you is because I am concerned for your soul. And sometimes I really hate preachers who are irresponsible, who only tell people about the good things and never warn people about judgment and hell because it is clearly taught in the Bible. If you are listening to this and you know that you are not safe, you don't fulfill the criteria that I have spoken earlier. I beg you, I plead with you to turn to Jesus. Jesus is your only hope. I beg you to live your life of sin. Your life of sin is nothing compared 
to the goodness of God. If you have really tasted God, you know how distasteful, how awful the things of the world are compared to God. And you turn to Jesus today, now, even right now, not tomorrow, not next week or next month. It is now. And the books were open. The books were open, plural books. Bible scholar believe that this is the judgment of deeds, including believers. Everything you have ever thought or said or done were written in these books, including your secret thoughts, what you have said and done behind closed doors. To your surprise, it will be written. Hebrews 4.13 says, Nothing in creation is hidden from His sight. These books record everything that we have done, good or bad. Psalm 62 verse 2 says, God will reward us according to what we have done. And Romans 2.6 says, God will repay us according to what we have done. This is the judgment of deeds. And another book was opened. And this book is called the Book of Life. The Book of Life is mentioned at least six times in the Bible. And this book determines who will inherit eternal life. This is the last and the final judgment for the dead. It says the sea will give up the dead. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. Each person will be judged according to what they have done. At this time, the sea, the graveyard, hell will throw out the dead. They will hand over the dead to face judgment. And each person will be judged according to what they had done. And this is a very serious judgment. This judgment determines whether we will receive eternal life or we will be thrown into the lake of fire forever and ever be tormented. Let me be very frank with you, my brothers and sisters. No one, including myself, will be able to withstand this judgment by our own righteousness. The Bible says that our righteousness is as good as filthy rags. We will not be able to stand before God that is blameless, that is spotless at Judgment Day with our credits, with our accomplishments, we will not be able to stand against the judgment, not with our own righteousness. Our only hope 
is Jesus Christ. Only hope is Jesus, our advocate. Because at the judgment seat of God, we stand naked, but Jesus will clothe us with his righteousness. Because we have received him, we have followed him, we have obeyed him, we have worked out our salvation with fear and trembling, and we have, by perseverance and endurance, all the way to the end, follow Jesus faithfully, obeying his commands, doing his will and his works we will be clothed with the righteousness of jesus and only with that we can stand before god there are so many passages in the bible that i cannot share with you here first john Chapter 2, verse 2 says, And He, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Our only hope is Jesus. Please hear this. Please understand this. At the great white throne, we cannot boast of our own deeds. Our deeds will not do, will not save us. And then it goes on to say that death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. What does it mean? Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire means it will be destroyed. Death and Hades, their services will be terminated because no longer needed in the new heaven and new earth. There will be no more death. No more death. All the people who have died and died again the second death has been judged and there is no more death. And lastly, and finally says, anyone whose name is not written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Death, Hades and those whose name are not written in the book of life, will be thrown into the lake of fire. Enemies, God's enemy, are defeated. Evil is gone, vanquished, destroyed. And God will make a new heaven and a new earth. And all the saved believers will join him in the new heaven and new earth forever and ever. Revelation 21. Earlier in my message, I mentioned to you that the day of judgment will be an exhilarating joy for some people. Because you will hear this. Well done, you, my good and faithful servant. Welcome in. But unfortunately for some people who have never called on the name of Jesus and be saved, or even those who say, Lord, Lord, but do not obey, what Jesus is saying, it will be an abysmal sorrow 
for these people. When they hear Jesus say, Depart from me, I do not know you. And that is the end. The end for such people. There is no turning back. Let us pray. Father, I pray earnestly in desperation for people who have heard this message, God. No matter which view they stand, Lord, but they will take heed. They will know that they will one day stand before you in judgment, O God. I pray, O God, that you will give every one of us this urgency, God. Father, to snatch people whom we know, Lord, that they do not have eternal security, that we will also warn them, we will also share with them about this eternal security that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, help your people to know that this is not a laughing matter. This is a serious matter, O oh God. And help us, Lord, to repent, to turn to you, O oh God, to leave our sinful ways. And Lord, to obey you, to have a daily walk with you, a vibrant relationship with you. Father, that we will enjoy your presence, both now and forevermore. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening. God bless you.